Hello you two, welcome back to another reading lesson. Have you remembered what our Viper skill is this week? Can you say it to me? That's right, it's sequencing. What does sequencing mean again? Can you tell me? That's right, to sequence means to put things in order. Before we begin, let's have a look at some of the awesome work that you guys have been sending in to our Year 2 email address. Well done to Chloe who had lots of fun in Book Babble where she was the teacher and she went on a word hunt for the word the around her house. Well done to Molly for also having a great Book Babble and finding the around her house as well as Dexter in 2L who found it on a super cool book, The Incredibles. And well done to Reuben, I love the pic collage that you've made of all of the different words that you found. I'll add on two dojo points for you now, for enjoyment. Our learning objective in guided reading this week is to explore different non-fiction texts. Can you remember what non-fiction means? Say it to me. That's right, non-fiction are books or pieces of text about real life things. They're not made up. Did you all enjoy your instruction hunt? What did you find? Let's have a look at what I found. I found instructions in a recipe book to make some waffles. I found instructions on how to use my new velvetizer for my hot chocolate. There was even instructions on the back of a rice packet, on other types of food packets, and even on the back of medicine. What did you notice about all of the instructions that you found? Pause the video and have a little discussion about it. I noticed that all of the instructions were different. Some had pictures and some didn't. Some had numbers at the start and some had adverbials of time. But most importantly, all of the instructions were clear and told me exactly what I needed to do. Before we look back at our instructions, let's make sure that we can read some of the words that are going to be in it. So. Let's start from the top, the blue words. Let's see if we can read all of those tricky words. I'm going to say one and then you're going to say it back to me. The first word is your. Your turn. Well done. The next one is of. Your turn. The next word is sure. Your turn. Well done. Then we've got the. Your turn. And the last word is water. Your turn. Well done. Let's say all of the blue words together again. Starting from the beginning. Here we go. Your. Of. Sure. The. Water. Well done. Next, we've got the word boiling. Can you see it? It's the word in red. I'm going to say it and then you're going to say it back to me. My turn. Boiling. Your turn. Well done. What is the root word in the word boiling? Pause the video and have a think and we'll come back for a check in a moment. Did you work it out? That's right, the root word in the word boiling is boil. Finally, we have the word bubbles in green. Can you say that word? My turn, bubbles, your turn. Well done. What spelling rule can you see in the word bubbles? Pause the video and have a think. That's right, they've added an S onto the end to show that there's more than one bubble. Now let's have a look at some vocabulary. These are all words that we will see in our text in a moment. So it's really important that we know how to say them and read them and what they mean. Let's have a look at the first one. We're going to have a go at doing our word wrap now that we would always do in our guided reading lessons in school. Are you ready? Okay. The first word is frosty. Repeat after me. Frosty. 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 
How many syllables? Two. Frosty is a result of the weather. It's when something is really cold. Get ready to do your action. Frosty. Our next word is dangling. Say it after me. Dangling. Shout it. Dangling. Whisper it. Dangling. How many syllables? Clap it with me. Dangling. Two syllables. If something is dangling, it means that it's hanging or it might even be swinging loosely. Get ready to do your action. Dangling. Okay, our next word is natural. Repeat after me. Natural. 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 How many syllables? Clap it with me. Natural. Two. The word natural means that it's come from nature, like a leaf, or a tree, or feathers. Are you ready to act it? Here we go. Natural, like the leaves on the trees. Our next word is saucer. Repeat after me. Saucer. 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 Get those clapping hands ready to see how many syllables. Saucer. Two syllables. A saucer is a small, shallow dish. Saucer. And our final word is separate. Repeat after me. Separate. 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 Clap it with me. Separate. How many syllables did it have year two? Show me with your fingers how many it had. That's right, it had three syllables. Separate means to move things apart so that they're not touching. Ready for your action? Separate. Remember, we're looking at instructions this week. So let's have a look at ours of how to make ice decorations. In a moment, I'm going to read the instructions and you can listen. You can follow along with your eyes, or if you can, you can follow along with your finger. Make sure you're listening really, really carefully and see if you can hear any of our new exciting words. Okay, are you listening? How to make ice decorations. You will need saucers, kettle, boiled water that has been allowed to cool, natural items like leaves, feathers, berries and grass, string or wool, and a freezer if the weather isn't cold enough. 1. Place your saucers on a flat surface and put the end of your string into the saucer, making sure a long piece is left dangling over the edge. 2. Lay natural items in the saucer over the string. 3. Gently pour in cooled water. Boiling it first helps to remove any bubbles. 4. Put the saucers outside on a frosty night or in the freezer. 5. In the morning, put the saucers in a tub of cold water to separate the ice. 6. Hang them around your garden as decorations. Pause the video now and see if you can have a read through of the instructions on your own or with a grown up. All done? Now, remember, our Viper skill this week is to sequence, to put things in order. And that's really, really important when we're doing instructions. Because if they weren't in the correct order, we would probably not be able to do what they're asking us to. What I want you to do now, in a moment, is pause the video and have a look at the instructions carefully. See if you can notice any key features that help us sequence in instructions. All done? I notice that my instructions have a title, which tell us what we're going to be doing. They have a subheading, which tell us what we will need, so that we know we have to get those things first before we start. And they have numbers, which help us sequence the order of what we do. We've got one to six in this. In other instructions, 
you might find that they don't have numbers, they might just have bullet points, or they could have adverbials of time like first, next and after that to help you sequence. I'm just about to eat my lunch here too, so I'm just going to go wash my hands. What did you think of my hand washing? Did I get it right? Oh, well, what do you think I did that was so wrong? Why do you think I was wrong? Pause the video now and have a think. What should I have done? These are the instructions that I followed year two, but I don't think they've been sequenced in the right way. Well, not from what you're telling me anyway. I wonder if you could perhaps put them in the correct order for me. Read them carefully and see if you could write them down. Once you sequence the instructions in the correct order, perhaps you could try some of these things. It's important that instructions are clear and sequenced properly. Perhaps you could help me by sending in a video of you following the instructions in the correct sequence and washing your hands, or you might like to draw some pictures to show me the correct sequence and how I should be washing my hands. Pause the video and have a go. Thanks for joining me year two. Don't forget, you can always send in your videos or your drawings of your instructions to our year two email address. I definitely need your help. Now, let's carry on with reading our story from yesterday, me and Mr P, Maya Storm. I wonder who's in that cave. Chapter four, shedding light on the situation. The cave was deep and dark and smelt of fish and sea. Hello, said Gran in a quiet sing-song voice. The sound echoed round the silence of the cave. Is there anybody there? They waited. There was no answer. Maya hung back just behind Gran. The cave scared her. She didn't like the darkness. Gran felt around and pulled a small torch from her pocket. Let's shed some light on this situation, she said. She moved the light slowly around the cave. Maya gasped and pulled at Gran's sleeve. Right at the back, in the darkest corner, was something large and lumpy and pale. What is it? whispered Maya. They tiptoed towards it. Close up, the lumpiness looked more like a shaggy, dirty, seaweedy heap of fur. Maya wondered if it was the cut. Maya wondered if it was the coat she'd seen in the boat. Gran put a finger to her lips and leant forward. A soft, regular rumbling sound was coming from the heap. She and Gran looked at each other. Sounds like snoring, said Granny Anne. It must be alive. Huff! <sighs> the creature moved. Maya leapt out of her skin and tried to run, but Gran held on to her. Two bright eyes sprang open and stared straight at them. There's no need to be scared, said Gran, her voice soft and gentle. Maya wasn't sure if Gran was talking to her or the animal. The words echoed in Maya's head. There's no need to be scared. There's no need to be scared. Granny Anne had said that to Maya so many times. When Maya had first arrived, when she'd refused to leave the safety of her bedroom, when she hadn't wanted to go to school. But this was different. This was a huge animal in the back of a dark cave. Maybe it was scared. The eyes stared up at Maya and she took a step forward and crouched down. She reached out and let her fingers touch the damp fur. Hello, she said. What are you doing here? The animal lifted its head. I think it's a polar bear, said Maya. A real, live polar bear in our cave. Gran had shifted the beam of the torch so it was shining on an old, brown, rather soggy-looking suitcase.
just close to the bear's front paw. Tied around the handle was a label, but the writing was so smudged that it was hard to read. It looked like a name, all dripping and inky. Mr P, breathed Maya. She turned the label over. On the other side, Gran shone the beam of the torch at the smudged writing. Maya's hand flew to her mouth. One Lighthouse Cottages. It was Maya's very own address. She slipped the label off the suitcase and put it in her pocket. She wanted to examine it more closely in the daylight. Gran sat down on a large rock and rubbed her eyes as if the vision of the polar bear with the suitcase might go away. Tell me I'm not imagining this, she said to Maya. Tell me I'm not going completely mad. You're not imagining it. I can see the bear as clearly as you can. <laughs> a polar bear with a suitcase, said Gran, as if trying to convince herself. Then she laughed. <laughs> now this is beginning to feel like a proper adventure. Why don't you open the case and see what's inside? After all, your address is on it. Maya wasn't sure. It's a bit rude opening someone's private property, isn't it? Do you think he'll mind? Oh, well, we'll soon find out, said Gran. I'll soon find out more like, thought Maya, as she bent down and went to unclip the two catches. The bear watched closely as she lifted the lid. Gran held the torch for Maya to see. Maya examined the strange selection of objects. It wasn't at all what she'd expected. A football, some headphones, a mouth organ and other unusual polar bear bits and pieces. It looked like his own personal memory box. Unfortunately, all his treasures were dripping wet. Would you like me to take this and dry it out for you? asked Maya. Mr P flipped the lid of the suitcase closed and put his paw on top. He rose heavily to his feet and Maya found herself face to face with the largest animal she had ever seen. She didn't dare move. She wished she hadn't touched the case. The bear came slowly towards her, forcing her to step back against the wall of the cave. Now she was stuck. There was nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. All she could do was wait to see what would happen next. The bear pushed his head forward and pressed his damp black nose gently against Maya's. He closed his eyes and breathed out. <sighs> Maya relaxed a little. This felt friendly, not aggressive. It was also completely bananas. She tried to stifle a nervous giggle. The bear stepped back and looked at her. Hello, she said. Mr P? I'm Maya and this is Granny Anne. Mr P turned to Gran and bowed. Goodness, said Gran, bobbing a small curtsy in return. I can't wait to tell Mum and Dad, said Maya. I woke them last night. I knew I'd seen a boat, but they said my eyes were playing tricks on me. Now I've proved I was right and they were wrong. Gran looked flustered. She put her hands on Maya's shoulders. No, no, we mustn't tell anyone. We need to find out what the bear is doing here. If you tell your dad, he'll go and call in the Coast Guard and have the bear carted off to the zoo. And that would be terrible. At the mention of the word zoo, Mr P started to swing his head backwards and forwards, giving the impression that he was even less happy about the zoo idea than Gran. But wouldn't a Z-O-O, -O, Maya spelt out the word in case Mr P recognised it again, know how to look after a polar bear better than us? No, said Gran, louder this time. They'd put him in an enclosure for the rest of his life and he'd never be able to run wild again. I don't think Mr P is a Z-O-O -O kind of bear. You can tell by looking at him. If he was supposed to be going to the Z-O-O, -O, he'd have it written on his label, wouldn't he? Maya wasn't convinced by Gran's logic. Maybe Gran was forgetting how dangerous bears could be. It wasn't as if Mr P was a pet she could take home and look after. Well, perhaps I could just tell Mum then, suggested Maya. Oh no, I don't think that would be a good idea either, said Gran. Apart from anything else, we don't want to give her anything else to... 
Granny Anne paused as if choosing her words carefully. To worry about. She thinks I'm as batty as a fruit bat already. No, she doesn't, cried Maya. Gran raised her eyebrows. I may not be quite as sharp as I used to be, but I know what your mum and dad are saying about me. I'm not stupid and I'm not deaf. Maya sighed. But surely mum and dad will find out about Mr P. It's not going to be easy keeping him hidden. We won't keep him secret forever, said Gran. We'll just let him settle in and perhaps introduce him to a few people so he gets used to the idea. That way, by the time mum and dad get to meet him, he'll be far too friendly for them to fuss about. Maya didn't try to argue. Gran's mind was made up. So you promise, said Gran, not a word to anyone. Maya nodded. OK, I promise. You're a good girl. As long as we stick together, everything will be all right. You'll see. You, me and Mr P, Maya asked. Exactly that, said Gran. You and me and Mr P. Chapter 5. Silence is Golden. Gran and Maya hurried along the beach. The tide was coming in and the sea was washing closer to their feet with each incoming wave. Maya knew Mr P would be safe in the back of the cave. The sea didn't reach that far, but she'd been reluctant to leave him alone in the darkness. Away from the bear, everything started to feel a bit unreal, almost as if she might have been dreaming after all. She was bursting to discuss Mr P with mum and dad, but she promised Gran so she knew she had to keep the secret locked inside her. You're late back, said dad. I was about to call the Coast Guard. Ring, ring. Dad chuckled and pulled his phone out of his pocket and pretended to answer it. Coast Guard here. <laughs> Maya rolled her eyes. It was one of Dad's regular jokes. No one else found it very funny. And how was Granny Ann today? asked Mum. Maya hated the way Mum always asked this question, as if she was expecting bad news. Gran was fine. Good. Very well. Really? Because Mrs Ross from next door called me to say Gran had disappeared out and left all the doors open in the pouring rain. Oh, she just popped down to the beach, said Maya. There's no harm in that, is there? Mrs Ross was always calling Mum about Granny Ann. Gran said Mrs Ross was a busybody and should mind her own business. Mum said it was very helpful having a next door neighbour who could keep an eye on things. And what did the two of you get up to? Causing trouble as usual, no doubt, said Dad. Not at all, said Maya. We, um, we collected some driftwood and we cleaned up all the plastic bags washed up by the store. Very good, said Dad. At least Gran hasn't forgotten how to be an eco-warrior. Maya could feel the suitcase label almost burning into her hand inside her pocket. She didn't like lying, but what could she do? She ran upstairs before anyone could ask her any more questions. Maya had to get through the rest of today and a whole night before she could go back to the cave. She pulled out the label and looked at it closely. Just holding it in her hand made her heart race with excitement. Maybe keeping Mr P's secret was part of the fun. For certain, the label was the most interesting thing she'd added to her memory box for a long time. She went to her table and cut out a piece of paper in the shape of a large bear. Today I met a polar bear. His name was Mr P. He arrived here in a little boat from far across the sea. I suppose in a funny way, he's a little bit like me. She liked the way it sounded. She punched a hole in one corner and then looped Mr P's label through before hiding it in the bottom of her memory box. She sat in her window with her box on her lap and thought about the day. It was amazing what a storm could wash up onto a beach. Most things washed up by accident, but a polar bear with a suitcase saying, one lighthouse cottages didn't seem like an accident. In which case, what was he doing here? Chapter six, ants in your pants. Maya jiggled and wriggled at the breakfast table. She hadn't slept well, a mixture of thinking about the bear and worrying about her promise to Gran. Ants in your pants, asked Dad. I'm not surprised. It's a beautiful day. 
I wish I could come with you to the beach and not have to spend the day at work. Maya tried to smile and concentrated on eating her toast. If Dad knew about the polar bear, he'd probably have ants in his pants too. It was a good thing Dad wasn't coming to the beach, or things could get very complicated. Maya wondered if he would really send Mr P to a zoo. As soon as she'd finished, she went to get ready. Maya's canvas shoes were still wet from yesterday, and the sand rubbed at her heels as she walked. Ran was waiting in her garden, and together they went out of her back gate and hurried down to the beach in the cave. Mr P was lying in the entrance, licking at his fur. As soon as he saw them coming, he got to his feet. Out in the daylight, for the first time, Maya could see the true size of the animal, and he was even bigger than she remembered. Wow, said Maya. Poor bear, said Gran, as if she was talking about something perfectly normal. The first thing we need to do is to get rid of all that sand, dirt and seaweed from his fur, and make him more comfortable. Let's take him to the boat shed for a fresh water bath. Come on, Mr P, called Maya. She ran along the beach, Mr P galloping behind her, kicking up sand, and Gran scurrying along at the back. Granny Ann's boat shed had been in her family for generations. Gran always kept it locked, but everyone in the family knew the code. It was the day and month of Granny Ann's birthday. 23rd of August, 2308. Maya waited as Gran fumbled with the padlock, fiddling with the dials to turn each one to the right number. Mr P watched with his head, tipped to one side. Gran pulled at the lock angrily. It's not working, she mumbled, then looked at Maya. You have a go. Before Maya had a chance to move, Mr P leapt forward grabbed the padlock with his teeth and started pulling for all he was worth. The door creaked and bulged on its rusty old hinges. Not you, said Maya. Me, you'll pull the whole place down if you do that. Maya nudged him to one side. She frowned as she looked at the numbers Gran had put in. They were completely wrong. Have you decided to change your birthday or something? Maya asked playfully as she shifted the dial and the lock popped open. Gran looked at her hands. Oh, my fingers must be getting old, she mumbled. Inside the boat shed was clean and tidy and bright. Surfboards stood against the back wall alongside a rail of black wetsuits and life jackets. On one side was a long table covered in old fishing crates, filled with snorkels, masks, buckets and spades and beach games. This is where the fun started. This is why Maya's friends loved coming to the beach with Granny Ann. Buckets, said Gran, handing Maya a large blue bucket. They filled the buckets at the outside tap, then took it in turns pouring the water over Mr P. In spite of her size, Gran was strong and had no problem hurling buckets of water at the bear. Maya struggled and seemed to go at half speed of Gran. Gran laughed and whooped. Water fight, she shouted. Not fair, shouted Maya as another bucket of water slopped over the top of Mr P and onto her head. Gran looked happier than Maya had seen her in ages. Maya filled her last bucket, but hadn't got the energy to throw it. I win, said Gran. Mr P picked up Maya's bucket and emptied it straight over Gran's head. Gran thought that that was funnier than ever. You'll get used to Granny Ann, Maya whispered. She's not like most grannies. A problem shared is a problem halved, said Gran. What's that supposed to mean, said Maya. It means that dealing with an old granny like me should be easier with the help of Mr P. The cold from her wet clothes had started to eat into Maya's skin. She was shivering. She snuggled in close to the bear and wished she had thick fur. Gran's teeth were chattering too. Oh, time for an emergency hot chocolate, I think, said Gran. We'll take Mr P back to the cave. He should be comfortable now he's clean. Mr P didn't seem very keen to go back to the cave. Maya found three old towels and carried them to the cave, laying them out on some flat rocks for him to lie on. They sat with him for a few minutes to make sure he was settled, and Maya stroked his paw while Gran sang him one of her songs from the sea. 
Their singing voice was wobblier than it used to be, but Mr P seemed to enjoy it, and soon he was snoring happily and didn't wake up, even when Maya and Gran crept out.